You can tell where a biblical author wants to emphasize by how much attention they give to that idea or topic. I've talked about this in other videos in the past, how the four gospels are basically stories about Jesus' last week, crucifixion and resurrection, with an extended introduction. For example, John's gospel is 21 chapters long, but by chapter 12, he is already into the last seven days of Jesus' life. So you see where his emphasis is. Half of his entire gospel is on that last week. Luke's gospel, by contrast, starts off with the first three chapters talking about Jesus' birth, genealogy, up until the baptism by John. Then in chapter four, he enters into Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Our reading for today is from Luke 9:51 through 62. This is another major turning point in Luke's gospel. From 951 to 1928, Luke is going to be discussing or recounting Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. Almost 10 chapters devoted to Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. A journey that probably would have taken a little over a week at most. But Luke devotes one third of his gospel to this journey. Now he signals this shift by giving us two markers in the text. The first is the clause, when the days drew near for him to be taken up. A slightly more literal translation of this would be, when the days were fulfilled for him to be taken up. The time has come, Jesus' ministry in Galilee is done, and now he is heading to Jerusalem for his passion. Taken up echoes back to Jesus' discussion with Elijah and Moses in his transfiguration, which Luke records for us in the first half of chapter 9. During the transfiguration, Moses and Eliza talk with Jesus about his departure. Now that time has arrived, Jesus is leaving Galilee and he is on his way to Jerusalem for his crucifixion. The second marker is found in the clause, set his face to Jerusalem. Luke is letting us know as readers that this is the focus, the direction, and the dedication of Jesus' ministry from now on. Jesus' journey to Jerusalem in Luke is rather interesting. First off, Luke is going to keep reminding us throughout this that Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. He's going to remind us of this in 13.22 and 33-34. Chapter 17, verse 11, chapter 18, verse 31, and then in chapter 19, verses 11 and 28. It's also interesting that while Luke's focus is on the journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, he provides us with very, very few geographical markers for us to track Jesus' journey. In fact, from the few clues that he does give us, Jesus doesn't take a very direct approach at all. Rather, he seems to wander all over the place. Luke's focus isn't so much on geography, but theology. He wants to show us as Jesus is journeying to Jerusalem, what the nature of his ministry and God's calling is. If you're new here, you're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this challenge is to take what I've been teaching at seminary and liberate it from the four walls of the classroom and make it available to you. Hopefully, this will encourage and stimulate you in your own understanding and reading of the Bible. So if you like this material, please follow the channel. Follow me on Instagram and LinkedIn as well. I will have the information down below. Hit that subscribe button and give it a thumbs up. All these are great ways for you to fulfill the YouTube mandate of follow me. So let's read our passage for today, Luke 9:51 through 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him but they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then he went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests 
but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hands to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, one of the few geographical markers that Luke does give us is right at the start of the journey narrative. They start with a village of the Samaritans. Now, Samaria occupied the hill country between Jerusalem and Galilee. Traveling through Samaria is challenging for the Jewish pilgrims. There were centuries of hostility and animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews. During the revolt against the Seleucid Empire, remember the Emperor Antiochus Epiphanes ordered a pig to be sacrificed on the altar in Jerusalem, and this set off their revolt. After securing their freedom from the Seleucids, John Hecarinus, who was the king of the Jews at that time, then expanded the territory and they conquered Samaria as well. When they did this, they destroyed the Samaritan temple that was on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. This is the same temple that Jesus and the woman talk about in John chapter 4, where she asked Jesus, Our forefathers said we should worship on this mountain, and you Jews said we should worship in Jerusalem. Even the Jewish historian Josephus records acts of hostility or violence against Jewish pilgrims during his day. Jesus and his disciples could have made it one long day to travel through the region of Samaria without having to stop there. Or they could have dropped down to the Jordan River Valley, gone south along the river, and that Jericho take the road up to Jerusalem. But Luke tells us that Jesus deliberately sought to stay, perhaps minister, in this Samaritan village. This would have definitely challenged the values and the views of his disciples. Their rejection by the village could have been based on the animosity between the two groups. Instead, Luke tells us that it was because Jesus had his face set towards Jerusalem. This is the second time he tells us that, but he's also letting you know that there's a theological reason why he's rejected. It's not just these cultural values at that day. When they are rejected by the village, James and John then want to call down fire from heaven to destroy the village. Now this echoes back to Elijah once again. Remember Elijah in the Transfiguration story, and the stories of Elijah are going to echo in this passage as well. Twice Elijah called down fire from heaven, once when he was on Mount Carmel having the confrontation with the prophets of Baal, and another time when he is confronted with a small army that is opposing him. Now verse 55 is really kind of amazing. All that we're told is that Jesus turned and rebuked his disciples. What's interesting here is Luke could have left this out, but the attitude of the disciples there against this village and these people that are different from them is still prevalent within the church today, especially within the American church. And Jesus' rebuke of them should be something that the church listens to today as well. Their attitude and Jesus' rebuke emphasizes God's all-encompassing love. Their request is contrary to Jesus' vision, identity, and the mission that he's been called to. In verse 56, they then move on to another village. Now, the implication here is that they're going to another Samaritan village. But this time, they have a much better reception. This then leads us into the second movement in our passage today, the three responses to Jesus' command to follow me. This week, I saw a rather interesting posting on Instagram about how this idea of follow me would be picked up today. While I would love to have you subscribe to my channel, follow me on YouTube, that is not what Jesus has in mind here. This might seem like a silly point, but so many people today think that following Jesus is just believing the Bible, going to church, or saying that they're a Christian. This is not at all what following Christ means. Mm. And I'm about out of coffee, 
So I'm gonna have to go up and refresh it. And I'll be back in a minute. Actually, I'll be back in a second here because with the magic of video, I'm gonna clip that out and you're not even gonna know the time that passes for me. So, back in a second. One hour later. I'm back. But I lied to you. I didn't just refill my coffee. I had lunch, I sat down, I took a break. So it was actually close to an hour. But isn't that interesting the way that we are able to construct and compress these time frames together, especially in a narrative when we read it in a book or in a video like this. But I digress. Let's get back to our story. In order to understand what Jesus means by follow me, Luke is going to employ an ancient rhetorical pattern called the rule of three. They use three people or three ideas or three discussions to bring across an idea. Now notice how Luke structures these dialogues. In the first exchange, the other person initiates the dialogue with Jesus. In the second, Jesus takes the initiative. And in the third, the person Jesus is talking to is going to take the initiative. Also, each one of these dialogues includes an important theological point. The Son of Man in the first, proclaim the kingdom of God in the second, and service of the kingdom of God in the third. Following Christ is not just a belief or a lifestyle, it is being involved in the same mission that God has called Jesus to, and we're going to see how that plays out. Following. The language that's used here about discipleship is one of the most basic metaphors that we have. When we follow someone, we walk behind them. We go where they go, we follow their path, they lead the way and initiate. It's a very personal and interactive metaphorical image that we learn from our earliest childhood days following our parents. Now let's take a look at these three exchanges here and see how this plays out. Dialogue number one, verses 57 and 58. We have a very exuberant person here who proclaims, I will follow you wherever you go. And this is probably a Samaritan given the context of the story. It's a very positive statement, but does he really know what he's saying? Jesus' response to him is rather cryptic. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, sometimes in biblical texts, foxes are used to bring across the idea of someone who's crafty or dishonest or untrustworthy. That's not what's being profiled here. Foxes are being used in contrast to birds. They have holes in the ground, birds have nests in the air. Both have homes. But they're being used to illustrate something about Jesus and his ministry. Metaphorically, this man has a home as well. By contrast, Jesus does not have a home in this world. God incarnate is essentially homeless, apart from the hospitality of others. And the medieval church called this attitude detachment, to renounce worldly possessions and follow Christ. Mother Teresa embodied this attitude and value. When asked about her worldly possessions, she replied, I carry all my worldly possessions around with me in this little bag. My personal needs are very simple. It's said that when she died, this totaled to a few saris, a couple pens, her diaries, rosary, and her copy of the Bible. Jesus' response that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head ties us back to the previous village denying them hospitality. Therefore, those who follow Christ can expect the same sort of reception and treatment. Second dialogue. In this dialogue, Jesus initiates the conversation by challenging the prospective follower to follow me. This person then requests time to go and bury his father first. One of the most important responsibilities that any child had during that day was their father or mother's burial. So Jesus' challenge here sounds very subversive. In the Jewish tradition, honoring your father and mother was one of the most important commandments to follow. So to follow Jesus in this manner would have meant to break the commandment. Obeying Jesus' response would have made this man a pariah in his village, perhaps for the rest of his life. Now some interpreters try and soften this by interpreting it spiritually. Let the spiritually dead bury the spiritually dead. 
or that this man was trying to postpone following Jesus because his father was not quite dead yet. I think, given the context in this passage, Jesus' response is meant to be very provocative, shocking. Compared to other aspects of life, the most important priority is to proclaim the kingdom of God. The third dialogue. In this third scenario, the man makes what seems to be a very reasonable request. Allow me to say goodbye to my family. And once again, this echoes back to the story of Elijah in the Old Testament. When Elijah found Elisha plowing the field, he called him to follow him. Elisha then asked for permission to go and say goodbye to his family, a request that Elijah granted. Once again, Jesus used a metaphor to explain this calling. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Just like the metaphor of following to explain discipleship is taken from how we move through this world, how we walk, especially in relationship with other people, now Jesus uses a metaphor from farming. Farming during that day would have been a simple plow with a metal tip on it that was pulled by an animal, if you could afford an animal. It would have taken a great deal of attention and concentration to keep that plow going straight because of the rocky and the hard soil within Palestine. Turning around would have meant that your concentration was broken and your furrows would have wandered all over the place. Now this takes us back to the opening of our reading. Luke tells us that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. Just like that farmer who has to keep his eye on some sort of marker on the other side of the field to make sure that his plow was going straight, Jesus has set his face on Jerusalem. That is the furrow that he is planning, the direction he is going, and he is not going to waver from it one bit. These three interactions in this passage challenge us to see our responsibilities and needs in light of our commitment to Christ. We are called to a life of sacrifice, we are to embrace the cross for the sake of the world. We are to have our eyes set firmly on that destiny that God has called us to. As Jesus set his face to Jerusalem, we are called to a single-minded purpose that is based on God's profound love for humanity and all of the world. Okay, I tried to think of something really profound and memorable to leave you with at the end of this video, but I think the three challenges that Luke records for us here are better than I could ever do. So I will leave you with them. Until next week, remember to follow me. Peace. <laughs>